Mary stands outside our bright pink office as we pull into the driveway. You can't miss her wide smile and her brightly colored chitenge fabric wrapped around her waist. She greets us warmly and proceeds to show us the garden that she's planted in the back of the office. Today, Mary is harvesting carrots and she proudly pulls out a few bushels for us to admire. We wash away the dirt and enjoy them for a snack. Sure, the carrots taste great, but what's more exciting is the joy and sense of achievement that Mary has on her face after her long and hard journey. Mary developed an obstetric fistula while giving birth to her second child. She went into labor at home where her grandmother advised her to stay, which was common. She labored at home for over 24 hours before she finally went to the nearest rural health center. She stayed in labor another three days before she finally gave birth to a stillborn baby. Back at home, Mary noticed she was leaking urine uncontrollably. She tried to seek help, but no one knew what her condition was or how to help her. Mary lost her work. No one wanted to be around her due to the stench of urine. Mary felt helpless, isolated, and alone. Mary lived like this for 26 years. I first learned about obstetric fistula in 2008 when I was on a ward in a hospital in northern Tanzania. It was my first trip to Africa. There was really no reason for me to know what obstetric fistula was, as I'm sure many of you, of you here in this room didn't know what it was. I was young, in my 20s, not yet a mother, and I lived in the United States where this, fist, where this condition had been eradicated over 150 years ago. I remember walking along the ward side by side with a kind, soft-spoken Dr. G, who told me about his work caring for women with this injury. I met many women that day, including Celestina, who was about my same age, but had a very different life trajectory than my own. Celestina already had eight children and had developed fistula on her last delivery. She thought she was the only one in, this war in the world that was suffering from this condition until she went, went to the hospital and saw other women living like her. All she wanted was a chance at a normal, healthy life. All she wanted was not to leak urine and have to co her continence back. This visit deeply affected me. How was it that I had no idea about this condition and no one else did, yet it affected millions of women and it profoundly impacted their quality of life. And it was completely preventable and treatable. Yet women couldn't afford the cost of bus fare to go to the health facility, let alone afford the cost of treatment. This injustice sparked something in me and has never stopped burning. In 2014, I found myself packing my bag, selling most of my worldly possessions to move my life to Kenya and later to Zambia. I had joined the Fistula Foundation to go launch new programs that we hoped would transform the landscape of fistula care and treatment in the countries. Our mission to build a network of treatment centers, to train surgeons, health providers, and community health workers, and to support quality fistula treatment for thousands of women women like Mary and Celestina. This work was exciting and challenging, and I dove into it with a huge amount of passion and commitment. I was there to deliver results and exceed our targets. And then, just like that, I seemed to find myself packing my bags again, although this time I was coming back to California, having handed over our programs to our exceptionally talented and dedicated national staff to continue running. So I found myself in a state of transition all over again and asked myself, how will I continue to be relevant now that I'm back in the United States? Where do I belong? I was anxious that after doing field work for years that being stateside would make me feel separated and distant from this work. I was an outsider again, although now back in my own country. And just at this moment of uncertainty and transition, I had the opportunity to meet all of you last January. 
I was so excited and humbled to be here with all of you talented, committed, passionate health equity leaders. But I was also very uncomfortable. Did I really belong here? What story of self could I possibly share that would explain why I was working on a childbirth injury that affected women half a world away from me? Did I belong with all of these people with such powerful personal narratives that connected them so deeply to their work and I felt I came from such a place of privilege? And what was this about community organizing? How does this apply to women living with obstetric fistula, I thought. After all, our purpose as a foundation is to raise money to help support treatment for women living with a devastating injury. These are some of the most disempowered and vulnerable women on the planet, suffering huge health inequity. How could organizing work in this context? There are many lessons that I'll take from this year, but are, there are a few reflections I'd like to share with you today. Number one. Haraka, haraka, haina baraka. It's a Swahili proverb I learned when I moved to Kenya, but it's never been more true for me than it was this year. Hurry, hurry, has no blessings. It's much better to do a job well and slowly than to rush and finish it. And the most effective solution is not always the most efficient. It's a very basic concept, but much harder to do in practice than in theory and it's important to just slow down. My fellowship project location was at the very northern top corner of Zambia. Any further, you would cross up into the Congo. The location was chosen by the team precisely because it was one of the hardest to reach areas, most underserved and most Im impoverished in the entire country. This is where we began to mobilize a group of fistula survivors and local leaders to build a support and empowerment group that, that would allow the fistula survivors to take greater control over their ability to earn income, to meet their physical, basic, basic physical and psychological needs. It was a slow start. The community's perception of an empowerment group was that we, as the donor, would come in and buy them things, such as an expensive grinding mill. Frankly, it was a very top-down way of thinking, which is completely understandable given the context in which development assistance has been rendered over the decades. There was far less of an interest in creating an enabling environment or developing the skills and building capacity of the community to ensure longer-term sustainability. So the change takes time to change the mindset, to get others on board, and let's not fool, us, fool ourselves, this is still a work in progress. We had several rounds of meetings, decided to relaunch the group to ensure we had the right people, a strong shared purpose, and an enabling environment. And the women voted to create a community garden and work together to prepare, plant, and harvest groundnuts and sunflowers, seeking input from other community resources and stakeholders. Mary, from our home office in Mansa, offered to go and spend time with the women to mentor and support them, sharing her own narrative and encouraging them to use their own skills and assets to take control of their lives and be advocates for themselves and for others. So the seeds have been planted and we're still waiting for the harvest. What we can say is there's still momentum and that it's largely driven by the community. And that in and of itself is progress. Word has also spread to a neighboring district, and the women were so keen to join the group that they were interested in walking a full day just to join in the effort. And so we'll continue and we'll see how this work can grow in Lombochomba and the neighboring district in a way that's sustainable and community-led and take our time to do it right. Number two, leadership is not just my own practice, but a journey of enabling others. Helping people who may not see themselves as leaders step into a space of greater confidence and courage to develop and use their assets and to harness their power to create change. Although it was not part of my original fellowship focus, in Zambia I was encouraged to see the enthusiasm among our staff to learn and practice some of the leadership principles obtained through the Atlantic Fellowship. We accomplished this through a series of Zoom calls, the first time we'd had ever used the technology in this way, with people calling in from five different parts of Zambia in the dark 
with no electricity due to power cuts to partake in this leadership training. It was an incredible use of technology, but even more inspiring was their enthusiasm. Together, we mapped our actors and assets. We drew our snowflake of distributed leadership. We talked about collective decision making. We coached one of our junior team members to step up and serve in a leadership role. Recently, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health has written us a letter commending us for a job well done and personally calling out the exceptional leadership of our program director, Walia, by name. And we see that the leadership skills from the Zambia team have extended beyond the small leadership, beyond the small fellowship focus to our new initiative in Eastern Province, where the team is just this week having their first round of stakeholder meetings and using these leadership practices from the ground up. Lesson three. It's time to evolve the narrative from one of misery and suffering caused by fistula to one that celebrates the agency and resilience of women affected and recognizes their ability and desire to be part of the solution. Never have I felt this more than on my recent trip to Kenya where I was just a couple of weeks ago. There I met with our staff and one of our incredible partner organizations, Wadadia, and I couldn't have been more excited because I saw it, community organizing in action. The Voices of Hope and Action is a movement enabling fistula survivors to advocate for their own reproductive health and rights and to be part of the solution to eradicate fistula. The women are using their own personal narratives to raise awareness and change misperceptions and reduce stigma. They are organizing to get more women to access treatment and educating community members how they can also play a role in preventing fistula, such as ensuring that women deliver at a health facility with a skilled birth attendant. And finally, they're agitating to create forums with high level decision makers so they can advocate for greater allocation of resources that will help Im improve visibility of this neglected condition, strengthen access to treatment, and will help get to some of the root causes to prevent fistula from occurring, like better access to family planning and emergency obstetric services. The women say they proudly that they're no longer a fistula sufferer, but a fistula survivor. And they embody the resilience, courage, and determination to make their own lives better and the women in similar situations. And finally, number four, I belong here. Whether that here is in this room, in California, in Kenya, in Zambia, or somewhere in between, it's not whether I'm an insider or an outsider, it's how I engage that counts. And even though I may not be in the same room or on the same continent, and even if I don't have the same lived experience as the women with whom I work, I know that I can and I should contribute my own unique assets, power, and voice to be part of this fight. I'm inspired when I think of the movement underway and the seeds that have been planted with our staff in Zambia and Kenya, with the empowerment group in Lombachomba, with the women in the Voices of Hope and Action Fishless Survivors Movement. And I'm inspired when I think of all of you, so grateful for this forum and for this opportunity for us to come together to motivate, encourage, and inspire each other. And I think of the thousands of women like Mary who have better access to treatment through the work of our foundation, but who are now going beyond to be strong advocates, to use their own voices to bring about change. And as long as they're in the fight, I'll be there right there beside them. Day in, day out, we are all in this for the long haul. Thank you.